Hello and welcome back and that's right today we're comparing to that is we're looking at the QNAP TS464 and comparing it against the newer released Synology DS423 and we're going to do it as quickly as possible. So straight away these are two four bay NATs from arguably the two forerunners in turnkey home desktop NAS solutions both of which are combined hardware and software solutions. They both also retail somewhere around the region of 450 or 550 NICA depending on where you are in the world factoring in local currency, delivery, shipping, profit margins and more. So Arguably, the reason you've been comparing these two NASes for your data storage needs is because maybe you've been moving away from the cloud or upgrading an existing NAS system and they've fallen within that loved, wonderful sweet point in terms of pricing and hardware that you get for your money. However, they are very, 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 very different. And although we're not really going to compare them in price or technically value, although that will come up, I will argue that these two provide an extremely different user experience in almost every single way. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, because let's be realistic about this, what we are comparing right now is not technically Synology versus QNAP. It is software versus hardware, because although they both provide both, it was arguable that they both provide more of one than the other. But before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about that hardware. So, straight on to the Synology first. Now, the Synology arrives with four bays of SaaS storage there on the front. There are also two M2 NVMe slots there on the base. In terms of storage, it is non-expandable. So those four bays are all you get. The compatibility listing is very, very broad. WD Red, Seagate, Toshiba, Synology Zone hard drives. All of them are covered here and available in the system. You don't have to fully populate the device. You can go ahead with just one drive if you want and then slowly add more drives as you go. On top of that, you've also got advantages in Synology's hybrid RAID system, which is the ability to mix and match different hard drives and ultimately have benefits in terms of overall capacity not available to you in traditional RAID configuration. Something, unfortunately, is not available on that QNAP. Now, on top of this, Synology's platform also has those M2 NVMe slots on the base. Now, up until recently, I would have you know, in this video said, oh no, you can't use them for anything but caching. But newer generations of Synology system in the 2022-2023 series have increasingly started to arrive with M2 NVMe slots being utilized as both storage pools and caching. Which is really good news, right? 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 Well, yes and no, because the way it has been approached on the system is arguably slightly different to what people would expect. Now, in terms of caching, when it comes to uh, write caching, that is when data is read going towards the NAS system, it improves the performance of data being written to the system as it writes onto the SSD, and then internally that data is moved over to the slower hard drive array. In terms of read caching, that is when data that is more frequently accessed, generally IOs, micro data, metadata, that sort of thing, is copied over to the SSDs, and therefore when more frequently accessed later on, it is then pulled from the SSD rather than the hard drive. Now, as useful as that is, most people that buy M2 NVMEs want to utilize these faster SSDs in order to take advantage of those performance benefits. And that's where your storage balls come in. So it's the ability to not only have those four bays of storage, but also two bays of M2 NVMe storage that can be used for high performance storage. But bear in mind, you cannot currently boot DSM from those, although you can install applications on them. That really is the limitations in terms of uh, installing uh, data on them, like a normal storage pool or app. You can't boot DSM from it. Also, the system cannot be expanded, as mentioned earlier on. Now, why have I suddenly focused all of that time there on the Synology there in terms of storage? Well, that is because on the QNAP side of things, it's a very different kettle of fish. First and foremost, although it lacks that fluid RAID system, it does take advantage, much like the Synology of traditional RAID, 0, 1, 5, 6, and even a lesser degree, those cluster RAID configurations. However, this system also arrives with a multitude of different expansion devices straight off the bat. A 2-bay, a 4-bay, an 8-bay, and a 12-bay expansion chassis that you can attach two of them to this device. So they've got four bays of storage. You can add a huge degree of storage in the system's life with both uh, JBOD and hardware RAID expansion devices. Something that although Synology support, they do not support on this system. Also, when it comes to the M2 NVMEs inside this, yes, there is support of caching. And yes, there is support of storage pools, but there is also... Q tier, a tiering system for storage where you've got your slower hard drive storage and then you've got M2 NVMe storage. And instead of caching where data is copied to the SSDs in one shape or form or copied back and forth, in the case of Q tier, 
A faster area of storage is amalgamated into a larger storage pool made up of hard drives and M2 NVMEs and the system gradually learns what is more frequently accessed data and then it moves it, not copies, it moves it over to the SSDs and this one storage pool that amalgamates all of the different storage medias allows you to create, in some cases, a hot, warm and cold tiered storage system all within the same NAS. On top of that, the system also has an M2 uh, has a PCIe slot on the rear, more on that later later on but that does allow you to install even more m2 nvme cards inside to increase that storage further still with two and four port cards available from qnap they like to add uh, even further storage base internally that are m2 nvme the last thing while we're talking about m2 nvme although both of them arrive with support with them as m2 nvme storage pools it's worth highlighting that on the case of the synology you can only i repeat only use their own SSDs in order to do it. Although you can use third-party SSDs for caching, when it comes to storage pools, which are getting increasingly popular, you could only use their SSDs, which are noticeably more expensive and lower performance than alternatives out there from the likes of uh, Seagate and indeed WD. And QNAP supports all of those, both for caching storage pools and of course for that tiering option as well. So in terms of storage, it has to be said that the QNAP is a great deal more flexible in every way apart from in that flexible RAID storage system. But when we're talking about these devices and particularly how you're going to interact with them, I would say one of the other things we really, 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 really need to talk about is this the ports and connections because that is another area on these two systems where there is a tremendous degree of difference between them and this really comes back to the idea of hardware versus software once again so in the case of the Synology it is arguable that the ports and connections on this are pretty boring okay I know it seems like it took a few extra seconds to say that even though we're doing this video to the clock but I'll tell you right now that that is important because this device not only only has one gigabit ethernet in 2023 which has pissed off a lot of people but it also does not have any means to upgrade it. It doesn't support any of the uh, 2.5G to USB network adapters. Hell, even one gigabit to USB adapters are not supported on this. There isn't even the support of adding a 10GBE connection via that new 10GB update, um, a little upgrade card that Synology rolled out, E10 G22T1 Mini. What a catchy name. I'm great and available for parties. But on top of that, the system, although it has USB port, USB port front and back, they are USB 3.2 Gen 1, so 5 gigabits per second. So around 500 to 550 megabytes per second transmit. Even though um, USB 3.2 Gen 2 is becoming ubiquitous and with increased um, USB support on a lot of client hardware we're seeing out there, as well as external storage drives really pushing the boundaries on the performance possible with connected USB drives. It's sort of real limiting in terms of the USB connectivity and the network connectivity on this box overall. Indeed, when it comes to USB connectivity, there are very, 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 very few supported USB peripheral devices available for the DS423+. Plus. However, moving over to the QNAP, in terms of hardware and particularly ports and connections, once again, you are going to see an absolute smorgasbord, notwithstanding that the USB ports on this device are a combination of USB 2 and USB 3.2 Gen 2, so 10 gigabits per second. But on top of that, those USB ports support a myriad of different peripheral devices, notwithstanding the 1000 megabytes per second USB drive, uh, drives I just spoke about. On top of that, you've got support of um, wireless dongles. You can attach everything from Wi-Fi dongles that increase from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6 in some cases and 2.5 to USB and 5 gigabit to USB adapters that are becoming increasingly affordable and allow you to increase the number of network ports on this device. Talking of that network ports, this device has two of them and they're both 2.5 gigabit ethernet. So just one of those ports is providing more bandwidth than any one of those two, uh, both of those two combined there. And even though both of them support link aggregation port trunking and multipath, it should be added that those two ports there are going to give you somewhere in the region of 550 to maybe even 570 megabytes per second external throughput potential on this device which is a fantastic amount of bandwidth for you to be playing with on day one on top of that there is there at the top a pcie upgrade slot now normally this device arrives with an empty pcie slot but as you can see i've gone out of my way and upgraded that port to 10 gbe that's right you can add a 10g port to this device on top of the two 2.5 gbe ports on top of the ability to add usb network um upgrade adapters there as well the network connectivity on this device is a joke how good it is by comparison and then when you add to that there is an hdmi output there with support of those usb 2 ports 
That is for KVM, keyboard, video, and mouse, that allows you to create and completely parallel user interface login there via that central user interface there for a you know, keyboard, mouse, for surveillance, for multimedia, it's a standalone PC, and using the Ubuntu included VM software if you choose to, as well as Synology's own applications, and even a Windows VM if you want to boot from that, while doing everything else simultaneously there. So in terms of network connectivity, and indeed general connectivity, the QNAP TS464 is most certainly the better NAS of the two, but things are gonna get real, real, real different because we've got to talk about software now. And when we get into the software, that's when we're really going to see that seesaw rock the other way because as good as QNAP's platform is with QTS, their own operating system, and NAS, GUI, and all the applications and services, and it is very, very good, very customizable, lots of adaptable applications there. It has to be said that it just does not feel or look as good as DSM. It's not quite as user-friendly as Synology DSM. QTS has a lot of features and services that are pretty, pretty good, and a lot of flexibility in those applications, which arguably, when you compare them to the more rigid status of a lot of DSM's applications, do give you a lot of wiggle room, but there is just no avoiding that the response times, that there's a cohesive design all the way through, and the range of first party applications on the Synology uh, platform, including the likes of Synology's collaboration suite, Synology Active Backup, and Synology Surveillance Station applications alone make DSM on the DS423 tremendously attractive. And if you are buying these solutions for the software more than the hardware, there's absolutely no denying in my mind that the DSM platform is going to be the better experience for you. But all comes down whether you're going to go for that software or that hardware now final thing before we wrap up today's video is going to be the internal hardware on both of these because although generally when we compare NASIs there's a huge amount of difference between them or we try to compare NASIs that are very very similar has to be said that whichever way you come at this comparison we are seeing a real time jump between these two because the TS-464 is technically the older NAS of these two. It really, really is. It's almost a year older than the DS-423. So you would think when you, what I'm about to tell you is that this one is out of date off the bat when we're talking about it in 2023. And it's simply not the case. The CPU inside is the Intel N5105, a quad-core uh, 2.0 gigahertz CPU that can be burst up to 2.9 gigahertz. That CPU has got integrated graphics on board and it arrives with uh, 4 gig of DDR4 memory that can be upgraded up to 16 gig of DDR4 memory overall it's a decent amount of hardware for things like Plex media server vm surveillance and just generally it's a great floating point cpu with the support of encryption 4k transcoding and everything you're going to need as a big boy in the world of data storage we're moving away from the cloud now this device here which has arrived in march 2023 Seriously, what is going on with the hardware? Because this CPU arrives with the 2019-2020 gen Intel Celeron J4125. That CPU you may have heard of, that's because it was in the DS920 that came out nearly three years ago. The CPU inside this device is very much old gen, and even Intel themselves have rolled forward with newer gen processors in the last few years. They've abandoned production of the CPU inside this in favor of the N5000 and the J6000 CPU. So the CPU inside this device is already, you know, not as powerful and not as efficient as the one inside this. Also, it's a Gen 2 CPU rather than a Gen 3, which does affect the available bandwidth to all the internal connected hardware. On top of that, the system arrives with two gig of memory that can be upgraded to 6 gig, which is a weird, weird, weird number. Why is that? That's because the default 2 gig that this system arrived with, of DDR4 2666 megahertz memory, is soldered to the board. The main controller inside has got individual memory modules soldered to the board. It does have an available sodium slot for upgrades, but because the CPU inside, in, inside this NAS is older gen and supports up to 8 gig, and... 2 gig has been soldered and can't be removed, that sodium slot then can only be used for a 4 gig module. Now, you might be wondering, what if you slam an 8 gig model in there? Won't you be absolutely fine? And technically, yes, you will be able to see 10 gig, but there is a school of thought, and in terms of internal processes, where you may not be able to fully utilize that memory, as well as going outside of the remit of officially supported stable memory by both the manufacturer and the brand can prove problematic with stability on your system. What I'm saying is, the CPU and memory inside this system are very 2020 gen. Indeed, when this rolled out without hardware, uh, the QNAP TS453D, the um, Locker Store series originally, the TerraMaster 2.1 and 2.2 series, all of those NASIs arrived with that CPU, but they've all moved on to their next generation, and this system seemingly has arrived with that older gen processor, which will knock some people off that take hardware very seriously. So once again, I've said it four or five times, but I will say it again. It depends on whether you want to go for software 
or hardware because although you get a decent amount of both on both of these systems we are talking a 60 40 scenario 60 percent software over hardware 60 percent hardware over software and that's really the big takeaway here and i know that sounds a lot like what i say in the other videos but in the case of these two devices in 2023 the disparity and gap between these two systems has never been bigger than i've talked about in this video but thank you so much for watching i hope you've enjoyed this video uh, look at that not too bad we covered a lot of ground today didn't we let me know in the comments but if you've enjoyed this video click like if you want to learn more click subscribe there should be links in the description to articles and guides on both of these systems use the free advice section if you need it or the free community forum if you need further help from me eddie and other members of the nas community and take advantage of the links in the description that will take you to amazon if one you found this video helpful one two you're going to shop there anyway because anything you buy via those links results in a kickback to here on that's compares just me and eddie and it helps us do what we do it's a passive way to support content creators i'll see you next time